Hello, my name is uh, MJ Mata. I'm a PhD candidate in the Law and Public Policy program. And first, I just wanted to mention that uh, the program that we're in, the fellowship program, it's really interesting because when Sarah and I first started talking, I think we paired up because she was covering natural gas and I was covering offshore wind energy. It seemed obvious. But then as we talked, we realized we were using different language, but we were really talking about very similar processes. So as you listen, if you would see, if you could see some synergies between what we're talking about that we can then talk about in discussion. Also, the whole viral analogy. Uh, I know I've struggled with it. Sometimes I think it fits, sometimes it doesn't. So maybe we can talk about that uh, towards the end of the program. So as I said, I'm looking at offshore wind energy and specifically the implementation in Massachusetts. It's part of a larger project, my dissertation, where I'm looking at similar processes in different states. But Massachusetts is really the, my primary concern because it was the first to seek and receive federal approval. And it may still be the first to actually have installed turbines because we don't have any, we don't have commercial scale offshore wind capacity in the United States yet. So Massachusetts may still be first. Texas might beat them. They're trying to beat them, but we'll see. So my goal today is I want to first discuss kind of the, the framework of what I'm looking at because what I'm doing fits, kind of fits in a literature in the public policy realm, but it doesn't fit that neatly. So I want to explain that first. And then I want to tell a few stories from the interviews that I've gathered and uh, from the process that I've kind of sought out. And as y'all see, I think, you'll see how significant the role of industry is. But the role of industry is a little bit different in my process than in Sarah's, as I, as I hope at least you'll see. So first I want to explain my name, my name, the name of the uh, talk, Powering and Puzzling, which I like the way it flows off the tongue, but I didn't just pick it for that. Because, oh, oh, I work. This is my first time using Prezi. I'm used to PowerPoint, so if I get scared of something, it's okay. <laughs> so, I'm sure we're all familiar with the common definition of public policy making of politics about the distribution of power, right? So who gets what, how they get it, when they get it, why they get it. That's kind of the standard definition, and rightly so, because all policies, that's what they do. They distribute power between people and organizations. But wrapped up in that is puzzling, right? So what I mean by that is, if we can talk about the Founding Fathers just for a brief second, they were, of course, concerned with power. They were taking power from one country and bringing it to their new country, dividing it up between the states and the federal government, dividing it up between different levels of government. But at the same time they were doing this, they were also looking into policy models elsewhere to try to draw lessons from. So they looked at the Magna Carta to get a sense of which rights should be adopted here. They looked to ancient Greece to see how they um, created their democracy and how that proceeded. So from the onset, these things have been intertwined with each other. Power and puzzling. But, so on the top is a famous quote, and everyone who writes about policy learning, about puzzling, usually leads with this quote. So I'm going to copy them and also use this quote. It appeared in a dissent in a Supreme Court opinion and it's pretty idealistic, right? It, it presents this idea, you know, as if there are 50 laboratories and we're all, every state's publishing their results and people are reading those results and everyone is sharing information and we're, uh, best practices are diffusing all over the place. But it's risky, hence the blackjack picture. It's risky because just like best practices can travel from one state to another, so can worse practices, right? So that's why I think this is important. I think it's important to study the learning processes of people as they implement policy. Because ultimately, 
my goal, and I think the goal of the policy learning literature, is to improve efficacy. Because if we can get as close to this as possible, we're better off. And we, we do have 50 examples. In all the states, they're under the same constitutional system. They have comparable governance structures. So it's there. It's, it, it should be possible to learn from each other. But we don't quite know enough until I publish my dissertation. Just kidding. We don't yet know enough about this. So what's the risk? Well, the risk is, like I said, that worse practices, bad practices can, can diffuse. This is further complicated by particular, uh, I'm not going to point fingers, but amendments to bills that withdraw funding from the National Science Foundation for studies on political science unless the director of the NSF provides a reason in writing saying how that project is connected directly to either national security or economic development. And of, you know, of course you could probably tie anything to one of those two things, but the fact that it's so vague makes it really difficult, I imagine, for the director to decide what gets funded and what doesn't. What can I justify better? Uh, and it might actually make them scared to fund a project because what if the powers that be disagree with, with their assessment? So in the absence of research looking at policy learning, it creates this vacuum of knowledge, kind of like what Sarah was talking about, that allows things to exist and look a lot like academic research. This is the American Petroleum Institute's, uh, part of it's cut off, but policy and economic studies, right? Sounds like a public policy journal, even though it's written by a trade association. And they write, oh, I, knew, I knew I was gonna turn those. And they write articles like, restoring natural resources, legal background, and economic analysis. Sounds like uh, something I would do. Sounds like something a lot of people in public policy would do. But it's not. It's something that a trade association has done that people in states actually look to and, it, and read these and they may or may not know the source, but it actually has an effect on policy. So that's, that's why I'm in this, because I think we can do a better job of spreading this information and hopefully diffusing better policies. So here's just another example. Are we running out of oil? And of course they conclude we're not, that there's a ton of it. And the, uh, however, there's a danger that attempts by the government to address the non-problem of resource exhaustion will distract from or even aggregate the challenge of removing barriers to supply development. So they do this objective study and just happen to come to the conclusion, yeah, government should, should just leave it as is, right? And then they conduct surveys, but they pick and choose, right? So it's interesting that the oil spills in US navigable waters They've done surveys from 1997 to 2006. Three of the worst 10 oil spills in the United States happened after 2006. So it's interesting that they never conducted the survey after 2006. Yet these surveys, they continue to do until 2012. So it's not like this was just a website that somebody forgot about. They're actively deciding not to research these things, which is all the more reason for objective uh, researchers to be involved. So back to Massachusetts. I talked about power and puzzling and how they're intertwined with each other. That presents a challenge because how do you know what resulted from learning and how do you know it didn't result from something else? And even if you know it resulted from learning, there's all these other factors that also come into play. So before I can study learning, I have to study these other things to see what role they have, kind of addition by subtraction. So if I can find these things, then what I'm left with, I can say, this is learning. So here's Massachusetts, and I just want to briefly go over the, the elements that sometimes affect the decision making in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts decides to build casinos. I imagine it probably had something to do with the fact that there's two casinos in Connecticut drawing people from Massachusetts down there. So this would be called 
diffusion by competition, right? So the policy did diffuse, but, but it was because of competition, right? So of course this also involves learning, because I'm sure, or I would hope, that Massachusetts, when they build these casinos, when they wrote the statute, would look into how did Connecticut do it? Did they do it right? Did they do it wrong? So it's all intertwined. Another example, the federal government tells all the states, hey, we don't have the power to force you to make the drinking age 21, but we do have the ability to print off as much money as we want. So if we send you millions of dollars a year, will you please make your drinking age 21, right? So that's why every state has a drinking age of 21, and that's called diffusion by coercion, or persuasion, depending upon what pers perspective you have. But you can imagine that even when there's coercion, when, for example, when the federal government gives all the states a mandate, healthcare, for example, right? They're all going to do it differently, and I would hope that some of them would be learning from others. Massachusetts, maybe because we've been doing it for a little bit longer than the other states, but. And then another one would be external norms. So if you take same-sex marriage in Massachusetts, for example, right? No state, no court had legalized same-sex marriage in a state until Massachusetts did it, right? So here I think there was probably an external norm, this idea that equality should be extended to uh, people of all orientations that influenced the decision of the Massachusetts High Court to legalize same-sex marriage. So that's, it's not that they, uh, you know, obviously they weren't forced by the government, the federal government, to do that. Obviously they didn't do it because they wanted, maybe they wanted to do it because they wanted Massachusetts to be the first, but I don't know. So here's an example of the influence of external norms. In, in other states who implemented same-sex marriage, look to Massachusetts to see how we did it. So that's my, uh, oh, hold on, one, one more thing. Oh, I, I think I forgot to put that slide on my path. But one more point. So I've been talking about external things that affect the state, right? Competition from other states, coercion from the federal government. Uh, but there's also internal characteristics that also influence the decision-making process, right? So if we're talking about offshore wind, the natural resources. You can't have offshore wind if you don't have a coastline. And there's you know, other characteristics that might play a role, uh, political ideology, certain propensities to innovate. So the takeaway is decision-making has all these various things wrapped up together, which makes my job difficult to parse out what it is I'm trying to do. This is further complicated by the existing literature, because the existing literature, which one? I use, I apologize to people over there, but I'm gonna uh, try to do this without blocking it. There's five problems with the literature that make its applicability in offshore wind difficult. The first is that, well first I should explain. This model is the Rogers Diffusion of Innovations model. And basically what it says is this, blue, this bluish purple line represents every states as they adopt some sort of policy. So it begins down here because only 2.5% of states have adopted it and then 13.5% adopt it and then a little bit more until finally the last few laggards adopt the policy. The yellow line represents the market share so when all the states have adopted it, 100%, um, there's no more states to adopt it. But this presents problems. The first problem is if you try to study learning by looking retrospectively after 50 states or several states have adopted a policy, how can you possibly find learning? People try sending surveys and then they get results from the surveys I mean, I can't remember what I had for, actually, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. Um, I can't imagine a legislator who gets a survey in the mail, hey, where'd you learn about X five years ago? I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe everyone has better memories than me. I don't know. So if you look backwards over several years, it's tough to parse out the processes of learning that policymakers undertook way back here. Another problem is that the literature 
does it distinguish between these types of peoples or these types of states? So it doesn't distinguish between the first state to adopt a policy or the last state to uh, adopt a policy. So my interest is in kind of filling these gaps. I want to look at states here. I want to look at Massachusetts and Texas because they were the innovators in offshore wind. They were the first to really attempt to do it. And I want to look at states that are considered early adopters because they're kind of in the second wave. They still have a lot of uncertainty, but at the very least they have a couple of states to look to for models. And I also want to look at when people learn, but the policy does not diffuse. So for example, Louisiana has decided not to pursue offshore wind. In fact, it's the only coastal state that has gone out of its way to make that clear. So I want to know not just about learning that results in diffusion, but I want to learn about learning that doesn't result in diffusion and see if I can figure out why. And also relevant to offshore wind is the people that are make, people in the weeds are really making offshore wind policy. And you'll see why in a few slides. So there's this ambiguous statute that people have to interpret. And these bureaucrats are given tons of power. So they're the ones who would be engaged in the learning. Not the legislators, but the mid-level bureaucrats. The literature doesn't really talk too much about them. And the fifth problem is that there's networks of policymakers, policy actors, as Sarah talked about. All sorts of people are involved. It's not as simple as this is a teacher, this is a student, this state taught this state something. There's all sorts of other things. There's, where, where did that initial state learn that thing, right? So there's a whole network that has to be understood if you hope to get at that puzzling piece. So this is just, this is Massachusetts, and that's uh, the Cape Wind Project. So my goal was to figure out the mechanisms of learning, that is the the day-by-day -day steps that actual people undertook to learn about this policy. So here is that ambiguous statute I talked about. So in 1997, Massachusetts decides to, first it decides to deregulate the uh, electricity market, which allows people to come in and try to create their own utility rather than Massachusetts picking who would be providing. And they also create this renewable energy trust fund, which has tons of money. And the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative, this is actually what they're told. There's a little bit more detail, but really not much more than this. They're saying, hey, here's some money. We want you to spend the money. And we want you to generate the minimum economic um, the maximum economic and environmental benefit. So you get this letter, what do you do, right? So you have to spend this money, but you know, oh, I forgot to say it. The Massachusetts Technology Collaborative, they weren't energy people. They, they were technology people who were, had been around for a while, had a reputation for working collaboratively, hence the name, with all sorts of people. So the legislature thought that they'd be the perfect fit for this. So these, uh, these folks are given this, this task, and so they have, to, they have to figure out, okay, what do we do? So the first thing, I should have moved that up. So MTC, they're the ones who were given the fund, given the power. The first thing they do is they talk to consultants up here. And they say, hey, what types of renewable energy can, can Massachusetts produce? So the consultants think about it, and they get back to the collaborative, and they say, eh, it's not, real, it's not really a good place, because onshore wind, tons of land in Western Mass, but all the people are in Eastern Mass. And so they went through everything, they went through the checklist, and nothing quite fit. So MTC starts, you know, they don't really know what to do, so they begin, as one of my, uh, person, one of the people I interviewed said, we were PDFing and Googling like crazy. Try, trying to figure this out. Even though I think at this time, it was probably Alta Vista, not Google, but I didn't correct it. So this happens with the consultants. 
And then, actually within the same year, Jim Gordon, who was a natural gas guy, he, he owned his own natural gas utility company, he comes to MTC and says, hey, what about offshore wind? MTC looks at their, the report that the consultants gave them, and it wasn't on the list of things that had been looked at. So MTC goes back to the consultants and says, hey, did you actually look at offshore wind and just not include it in the report? And they say, no, it wasn't on our radar. It was that unknown that it never entered their purview. So Jim Gordon says, but hey, I know how to do it. Trust me, I know how to do it. Because he had, he had gone to Denmark and learned about it himself. So he went to Denmark and learned about the technical aspects of it. But he didn't understand the regulatory aspects. I really should wrap up so we have time for discussion. So I'll, I'll talk even faster. So Jim Gordon influences MTC to start looking into offshore wind. He shows them that it's possible. He shows them he knows how to do it. So MTC says, OK, well, we have to talk to the federal government because they're the ones who three miles offshore up to three miles is state. Beyond that is federal, so they need federal approval. Well, there's no federal agency that explicitly has offshore wind responsibilities. They go to one agency, MMS, and MMS says, uh, nope, our enabling statute just says oil and gas specifically, even though we do offshore oil, can't do offshore wind, sorry. So they say, okay. They go to the Army Corps of Engineers. They play around with a couple statutes. They find an interpretation that kind of allows them to do it, and they say, okay, we'll start doing it. I'm gonna skip the UMass Amherst bit in the interest of time. So the Army Corps starts, oh, I want to go. I don't know what I did wrong. I want to go to the next slide. Next. Next. Okay, good. So as soon as this starts happening, as soon as the ball gets rolling, this is where the opposition starts coming in. The people on the Cape who do not want offshore wind. I'm not sure how clear this is. I, I took a uh, Cape wind, um, well, it was an independent study that showed what it would look like off the beach um, in, I think it was Yarmouth. Which, so you can see kind of these faint turbines, or hopefully you can see these faint turbines. Save Nantucket Sound, who was the main opposition group, they came out with this one, even though you can't really find out who did who uh, did this analysis. But you can see how they each present very different pictures of what Cape Wind would actually look like. Here's another thing that they uh, distributed, which shows the height of a turbine compared to Statue of Liberty, the Washington Monument, um, or you could call, I guess it's Bunker Hill Monument, the Pilgrim Monument. I don't know, don't, don't know what that is. But of course, this ignores. Was that? Pete Town. Okay. So of course this ignores the fact that this turbine is five miles out, right? So, but that's what that's their that's what they do. So, oh, so this is a quote that I was given uh, from. Her job was to help facilitate the public process that followed the outcry on the previous slides. So the state realized pretty quickly. Okay, we have this private guy. It's in the papers, it looks, you know, there was no bidding process, so we really have to get a public process going. So they really did. They really advertised it, tried to get people on board. They had a whole, the first phase was just deciding what the questions were. Not before answering anything, deciding what the questions were. But as I was told, the third group, no matter what data they read, could not be convinced. And that group still exists. In fact, if you go to the uh, Save Our Sound Alliance to Protect website, they, they still say they have a chance. There's this another lawsuit that they're, they're filing that's going to get dismissed, but they're still asking for, to raise money in. So as a final slide, so we can have a discussion, uh, in the interest of time, I skipped over. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is very interesting. So 05, they're in the middle of their approval process when the Energy Policy Act of 05 comes out and says, uh, we're gonna move offshore wind from Army Corps of Engineers to MMS. 
who was the initial agency uh, that the Cape Wind had gone after. Cape Wind was ecstatic about this because MMS had a reputation for very quickly approving oil and gas projects, so they thought they'd be treated the same. Turns out they had to start the process all over again, which added several years to the timeline, which is why now, 2014, we have no turbines, but 2015 looks promising. And this is the government's own uh, prediction on electricity generation by fuel. And this is 20, I don't know if you can see this, but here's, here's about where we are, 2014. Here's 2040. And the line, the line for coal, pretty straight, nuclear pretty, renewable climbs up a tiny bit, but natural gas really shoots up. So the role that the Energy Policy Act played in that uh, is difficult to parse out, but I would argue that it, it was significant because it delayed offshore wind by at least three years, and it really gave fracking the, the go-ahead. So I think we should have a discussion now. It's kind of, I'm sure you're sick of it. 